Hello and welcome to this new video. Today we are going to talk about how I revive my website using a 50 year old software. Coming up. So yes, today we are going to talk about a 50 year old software. My goal with this video is twofold. I want to first be able to show you how to use this new software. Well, new is a weird word for a 50 year old software, but this software and I also want you to be able to know when to use it. Because with most old GNU software, it's a little bit hard to know when you're supposed to use that specific software and where it makes sense to implement it inside of whatever you're trying to do, right? But with this example, I think that I'm kind of hitting at the core at what this software can do. But first, why did I even need to redo my website in the first place? Why did it need to be revived? Well, there was a few issues. My website is generated using Obsidian. Now, Obsidian is a note-taking software. It takes the note in Markdown and it makes them good looking so that you can actually use it and not just throw your notes inside of a standard text editor. Now, when I'm generating the HTML that goes onto the server, it's a plugin that takes care of that. And that plugin, for some reason, is not able to fully generate the pages that I ask it to do. Sometimes I would have missing part of pages, I would have some function that would not work. So at the end of the day, that needs to be fixed because I don't want to have to stress about, hey, is my website working when I add this page or is it not? Or am I screwing something else on the website by adding this new page? That does not work. I want everything to be generated and me not thinking about it. So here I add two solution. Solution one would be to fix that plugin. Problem is, I don't know how to code. Well, I know a little bit, but I'm very garbage at it, right? It would take me a lot of time to actually understand the code and fix it. So that's not really a possibility. Option number two would be to recreate the generator that actually produced that HTML code. So to reuse the HTML code that is already on the website and to apply it when we detect specific pattern inside of the markdown notes. Now, it turns out that's way easier than fiddling around with the plugin because we will be learning awk today. Awk is an awesome, very old tool that exists exactly for that purpose. Well, it can do a bunch of things, so let's just get into it, right? Let's get into what Awk can do and how to use it. So let's start by the very beginning. The goal of Awk is to execute your script for every line of text inside of a file. So for example, if we have a file full of first name and last name, and we would do print $1, it would only print the first name. That's because $1 is a variable made to point to the first field. Now, the field separator by default is the space, so if we do print $2, it would then print only the last name. This is the base of how awk actually works, is that you can use those field separators in order to manipulate the data that you have and to be able to print it however you want, so to be able to change it how you want it to be. Now, if you wanted to print the full line, not the specific field, you could by doing $0. So now you know the very basic of awk let's get into a little bit deeper so we are going to try to learn bit by bit how awk can be used but first let's just dig a little in the script that i've made to actually create the website so here we see that we have first a shebang that's of course needed in any scripting language that's because the shebang is there to tell the system how to execute our script using the hash symbol the exclamation point we can tell our system to use this executable to run the script Right after that, we see the little code block called begin. Now there is two special code blocks that are possible in awk. It's either begin or end. Those of course apply at the beginning of the script. So before we have even opened the file and at the end of the script, so at the very end that you ran all of your code. Now what we see inside of the begin code block is that we are initiating a variable. So here we see init being set to zero. So we could obviously set a whole bunch of variables that we could use further down the script. But for now, what I want you to know is that you can do things at the beginning of your script using the begin code block, and you can do things at the end of your script using the end code block. Now let's get a little bit deeper at a place that will feel way more logical, right? Let's go into the highlighting code. Now in Markdown, highlighting code is as simple as putting two equal signs together on both sides of the text that you want to highlight. 
So inside of my note file, I have a bunch of places where I will have those two equal sign each side of our text. And that means, hey, this text is highlighted. Now, the first thing that we need to do is to detect occurrence of that structure. We need to find where highlighted text exists. Now, the way that we do that inside of awk is by using match. Match is a specific command that we use in which we will specify the variable that we are searching in and the pattern that we are looking for. So of course here, what we see is $0, which means we are looking through the whole line. And after that, we are using two slash. The two slash are used to delimit a regular expression because that's what we will be using. And we see here we have the equal equal sign on both side of a dot and a star. Now, the dot in regular expression means any characters. So it can be anything. It doesn't discriminate. If there's some characters, it will detect them. Now, by default, the dot is only one character. Now, if we want to repeat that character, we can put the star. The star is there to say the same thing as what just happened before. So because we have the dot that is there to say anything, and right after we have that repeated, so we can detect any text or any characters that are in between two equal sign on both sides. So here match will output the position of that string inside of $0. So if it exists, it will give us a value. For example, if we would have that string, well, it would be a value of 5. So of course, when we would test it against 0, if it detects something, it's going to be a value other than 0. So then we are able to run the code that we see below. Below we see sub. Sub is there to do a substitution. Now, sub by default, if you give it no variable, will work inside of $0. So this is why here $0 is nowhere to be seen, is because sub already knows to go into $0 if it's not specified. Now, the first part of the sub command is our regular expression. So of course here, it's not really a regular expression. It's more or less just find the two equal sign. So at the first two equal sign, we will substitute by a mark HTML block. So of course, in HTML, we need to open a tag and we need to close a tag right after that. So that's why right after we have the sub that will detect the ending equal equal sign and will then produce the closing mark tag. So by doing that, we have successfully highlighted the text inside of our HTML. And if you want to know why there is a while loop here is because we need to execute that code again if we have detected some highlighted text, right? Because if we have detected one chunk of highlighted text, we may need to execute the, the code again because there may be more highlighted text further down the line. So all the inline equals one, then the while loop, the inline equals zero, and further down, if we are inside of the if statement inline equals one, is just there to make sure to repeat it if it detects highlighted text. So this is the basic how to use match and substitution. Now, there is much more that we can do using awk. Let's just go to headings to have another example of how we can use awk. Now, headings in Markdown are done by using the ash symbol. So if you have one ash symbol, it means that you have a very big heading. If you have more ash symbol up to six, it means that you have a smaller and smaller heading. So we need first to detect if the first character of the line is an ash symbol, because if it is, well, we know then that we are inside of an heading. So to be able to do that, we need to test using if, if a match is found with the first field, the first thing that is mentioned inside of our file, technically we could put $0 there and it would still work, but here I decided to use $1, and then we can detect the little up symbol, I don't know how to call that in English, and the ash sign. So the little up symbol, it means the start of the variable. So if it detects that at the start of the variable, we have an ash symbol, it will give us the position of that ash symbol, which of course will be one. Now one not being zero, it automatically means that if we find an heading, we will drop down into heading code. Now let's skip over the code that detects footnotes because that's not what we're here to talk about today. Let's look about how we create an ID. The thing with headings is that they're pretty special. We need to be able to call them and to go to them from other pages and from the same pages. The best example of this would be if you look at my note when it comes to 
a Linux kernel review. Inside of the Linux kernel review, I will put a link to every file system that we review, and then you will be able to go directly to the right heading on the file system page. So that can make things way easier to navigate, but for that we need an ID. So the way that we generate this ID is to standardize it, right? Every ID needs to be generated in the same way. So let's make a simple way to generate those ID. We need to first put the line that we have and put it to lower. To lower, we'll put everything into lowercase. So doing ID equals to lower of $0 means that we now have the full line lowercase inside of the ID variable. Now what we need to do after that is to make sure to substitute the ash symbol in front of our ID. Because of course ash symbol are not a great thing to have when you want to put that information inside of a URL. We need no ash symbol to be inside of our ID. So here you see that we have the same contraption with the little up symbol, the ash symbol, but after that we have a plus. Plus is very much like star, but it forces you to have at least one time the character to the left. So here what it means is one or more ash symbol. And after that, it's notable, we have a space. The space need to be detected and it needs to be removed. So here we would end up with just the text that is contained inside of the heading as our ID and all lowercase. Now there's still an issue here for our IDs, right? When we want something to be put inside of a URL, we don't want spaces in there because when we have spaces, we need the special characters and it makes the URL looks very dumb. So let's fix this using gsub. gsub is a special command that does exactly the same thing as sub, but as much as it can, right? Sub will only run once, while gsub will run as much as it can. Now we are doing something pretty special with our square brackets, the double square brackets with blank inside. What that says is if we have multiple space or if we have tabulation or if we have one space, whatever is blank will be transformed into a dash. So now our ID will be URL friendly so we can now put it inside of our headers so that we can further down the line generate them from a link and be able to go directly to that heading. Now let's see how we put that text inside of our HTML because we are going to learn a whole new function. Now we see here that we have a bunch of if that detect how big our heading is. Of course, if we have one ash symbol, it's a big heading. If we have more ash symbol, it's a smaller and smaller heading. So what we can do is just detect the first field, which should be only ash symbol. And depending on how much we have, put the appropriate size of heading inside of our HTML code. Right after that, we see that we do $0 equal substring $0, comma, 3. Now, why are we doing this? The reason why we are doing this is because substring is able to cut down on an existing string. So the first part of substring is the variable that we are going to read, and the second part of substring is the starting characters. So here what we are doing is we are skipping character 1 and 2, which should be an ash symbol and a space, and we are starting directly into the third character, which should be text. So here we have two variables that we can use throughout our print statements, which are ID and 0. So we have both of those values that we can now use inside of our HTML code. And what we see here is that we apply for, at some places, the $0. For the ID, we of course put ID, and this generates exactly what we need in order for the website to work. Okay, so now you are officially in the club of people that stayed long enough to be able to witness the end of this video. If you are an absolute unit, you can use $0 in the comments. $0 is the proof that you are a true unit. Now, allow me to yap for about four seconds to tell you where I'm going with this. Now, of course, this is all because I wanted to make the website work. And for those that follow me for some time, you know that I like schematics. I like making them. I like when they work also, and they have not been working on my website for a long time. So probably not next video, but in the near future, I will produce something similar to this, but with another GNU software fixing the schematics. So we are going to produce some SVG files using whatever I find that will work. <laughs> so this will probably be a fun thing to do. So I hope you enjoyed. Leave a like, subscribe, comment, do all the great things that you do. And of course, take care.